Hello. We'd like to welcome you to another It's a Grand Life. And our guest today is going to be a blessing to everyone in our audience, especially you folks that are wrestling with legal issues and, and trust issues and what have you since you became a grand family. Our guest today is an old friend of mine, uh, Gene Richards from Cummings McClory, Davis and Acho. And uh, uh, he has got a lot of insight into the legalities of being a part of a grand family. And Gene, welcome to It's a Grand Life. And could you tell our audience a little bit about the scope, scope of work that you do at uh, Cummings McClory Davis and Acho? Thank you, Craig. What an honor to be here and share some screen time with you. Uh, we go way back, as you said. Now, just to clear up one point that may be confusing people already is I have Norman Richards as my name down there, but everybody calls me Gene. Uh, if you have some concerns about that, just call me up and I'll explain how that's the case. So I'm Gene Richards. I've been an attorney for uh, over 25 years now, and I've always focused in the estate planning and elder law uh, segment. And uh, I actually uh, grew up overseas. My parents were missionaries. And for me, becoming a lawyer, since I didn't seem to have what it took to be a minister, becoming a lawyer was the next best option and uh, allows me to work with families, provide that counseling uh, element uh, to my career. Uh, so I love working with families, love working with folks who are looking at the future, wanting to make sure they have things in order. Oh, that just sounds great. And I know, know that um, we have many listeners gonna, that are really going to have a, a lot of questions uh, regarding your expertise. And I hope I can bring that out today during our time. And and uh, so when you talk about being a uh, someone who specializes in trusts and elder law, what does that mean for the uh, the, uh, the, the general public? I mean, why would someone contact you? So I boil it down to a couple of simple concepts. It's about management and it's about flow. Uh, most of the time people call and say, hey, Gene, I need a will, which tells me they're thinking about the flow of what they own when they're gone. So end of life, what happens to what I leave behind? But there's also this very important concept of managing, arranging for the management of what, what you have, whether it's you know what you own, legal decisions, or your personal health decisions, allowing the right person at the right time with the right power. It's, that's what it boils down to, the right person, right power, right time to manage and control the flow. It's that simple. So, and, you know, when, and by the way, to your point, why would people need to do that is because yeah. When you don't plan, very frequently it leaves behind a chaotic situation or causes your loved ones to have to go through more steps than they otherwise would have to, sometimes through the court system, which, while that's not bad, is not always optimal. Right. It, it, uh, and it, you want to have control of the outcome, right? I, I would imagine. And uh, by working with you, you can get things buttoned down before anything has to go into effect. But so it, our audience are our grandparents raising grandkids. We, we're all part of a grand family. And um, so why why would uh, folks from a grand family need to talk to you regarding estate planning and uh, um, the trust and what have you? I mean, just um, because it's it's kind of unique. They, you know, we've raised our kids and now we're raising our grandkids. Um, I would think that'd be a real a need to talk to someone like yourself. I agree. Uh, probably the main reason you would want to do planning is because the default rules are not in your favor. So having grandparents raising grandchildren, unless there's been an adoption to create a parent-child relationship, uh, you've got some real unique uh, things you're trying to navigate. I presume, which, and, and correct me, Craig, where I may be wrong, if you have if you have a grand family, that means the the parents of the grandchild are either out of the picture or are not able to serve effectively or appropriately as parents. So the grandparents have had to step in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what percentage of people actually go through the adoption process of grandchildren, uh, but uh, that unique relationship requires some, some proactive planning. So... Um, you know, from a simple, just as a simple example, if someone passes away, the question is who 
who inherits naturally from them. Uh, and let, let's just say it's a, a, a single grandparent, uh, so they're not married anymore. So their next of kin are going to be their children. And it may be those children that are the reason that you've got the grand family to begin with. So you, right. you need to avoid that, or at least evaluate is the default rules that kick in appropriate. So planning is oftentimes about actually rearranging the rules uh, that are set by state law and uh, common law, you know, history of law to achieve the result that's optimal or best for your situation. So you, you brought up a point that I didn't even think about when I was putting together our, our questions for uh, today's uh, podcast. And that is the distinction between a guardianship and an adoption process um, yeah. in, in, in your expertise why should is one better than the other or is one easier to work with from a legality standpoint well that's a very broad question um <clears throat> we could be here all day Craig. <laughs> uh well i you know i think so we were talking about from an inheritance point of view so right. again you know, we're kind of all over the map at some point we're going to talk about how do i make sure things are managed properly for my grandchild right you know, while I'm still here, but I'm not able to be in charge. And then, you know, how do I make sure things get to them? And we were I was really on this level of the default rule about inheritance and mm -hmm. next of kin, you know, blood, blood kinship. So in that respect, being a, uh, a parent, you know, an adoptive grandparent, again, I'm not sure I'm using the correct lingo for your for your audience. But if you're a grandparent who's adopted a grandchild there, you've now got a direct inheritance, you know, uh, line. So it, whether you plan or you don't plan, I shouldn't say that it's a little broader than that, but the default rule wants to favor that, that grandchild who's considered your child. Okay. However, if you're a guardian, that's a lifetime responsibility and you know, you're managing the care, uh, you use the word guardian, but probably also serving as a conservator. So the guardian takes care of the person, the child, you know, decides, makes medical decisions, you know, controls their living environment. The conservatory is managing money or the finances for that child, assuming they had money of their own to be managed. Uh, mm -hmm. So the guardian and conservator is a lifetime appointment, or at least is, is provided by the court as long as is appropriate. So from an inheritance point of view, the guardianship or conservatorship is not as optimal or favorable as, a, as adopting that child. However, you with some planning, you don't need to adopt. So I don't want to drive people toward adoption if they don't want to. But that's where the planning becomes critical. So guardians and conservators have court authority. So they have all the power that they need to make life decisions for that child. Uh, but the you know, what do we do when, if we're not here, when we're gone, who's going to take care of that grandchild? It becomes more critical to do, you know, to talk about trusts and wills and, and, and what's appropriate. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, one of the things that I see, that not every grandparent uh, maybe goes as far as to get a guardianship, a conservatorship. And you know, I, I presume some of your audience is sometimes going to take sort of the short-term responsibility. Maybe this isn't a lifelong, you know, the rest of days kind of responsibility. Uh, you know, and so, you know, there, if you don't have the court authority, the tools there are going to be the powers of attorney. And you haven't asked that question yet, but I'll just tee that up in case you want to fold that in somewhere. Um, so think of it this way, just to set the setting. Wills and trusts are about really about handling things that you leave behind uh, if, if the grandparent goes first. Powers of attorney are about lifetime management if you do not have guardianship and conservatorship through a probate court. So I'll set it up that way, and then you ask all the questions you want. Well, um, I, so if I'm reading you right, it's whether there's an adoptive situation or whether there is a guardianship situation for the grandchild by talking to someone like yourself, you can navigate the pathway that makes the most sense for the family in either one of those scenarios. 
That's correct. It's never just as simple as, hey, I need a will. There's so many other variables. It's where are we in life? What is the season of life? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the concerns for the future? You know, what, what's the status of the biological parent of the, of the grandchild? Um, what do you, there's so many variables. And that's where attorneys come into play. And that's the main reason you should speak with someone who, who has that skill set is because we see a universe. Uh, you know, so it, it's kind of like me looking at the stars going, hey, there's the Big Dipper. And then you talk to an astrologer. <laughs> I don't right. know, astronomist, you know, and they're right. like, oh, look, you know, there's, there's all these other things you didn't know about. Uh, right. that, that's really my function is to say, you know, you may you may see one little constellation, but I've got an entire universe of, uh, of, of factors and legal concepts that need to be considered. Uh, it's not always complicated. It's just you need to know what you don't know. And so you need to speak with someone who's skilled in those things. Well, absolutely. And uh, there's so much we don't know when we're just, in, you know, uh, uh, starting up this situation where we're now um, parents again of our grandchildren and that whole idea of having the right powers of attorney. I know in, in our situation, uh, we uh, with our uh, granddaughter, Grace, we started to panic a little bit when we did not have the authorization to contact the school, the teachers, mm -hmm. the administrators, the principal. And uh, to find out even about homework assignments, because we were essentially raising our granddaughter without the powers of attorney. And, uh, um, and may, can you get into that a little bit, how valuable those uh, powers of attorney are and, and the scope of, of those things? I think they are critical. Uh, it's, and they are something most people don't think about because you're focused in the moment. You're living life. You've got that crush of responsibility and that weight and, and so you're you know hey i'm here i'm healthy everything's okay and, and you're trying to navigate for you. so a lot of people until they run into an obstacle like you did don't even think about it um but they are one of those documents that uh, you, you may be forced to address uh, and, and and so how do you you know deal with that because there's more it's school work it's um uh Heck, it's signing a permission slip or a field trip, you know, uh, you know, permission slip. Um, and and so I'm sure grands run into this more often than just your average parent who really very often they don't even think about it. Right. Uh, but that document, uh, they, they come in different flavors. So um, they usually come in. There's two types. So a, a power of attorney uh, is. Uh, something that gives you permission to act for someone else. Now we run into a little bit of dilemma. It's going to depend on how old the child is. So uh, I'm not sure what your situation was, but if you have a minor child or grandchild that you're taking care of, where do you get that authority? Because a power of attorney is something that a person gives to someone else. And if the child is under 18, they're not able to give a power of attorney, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So where do you get the authority? You can get the authority from the biological parent. So there is something called a delegation of parental authority. But that's somewhat limited because it's only good for a maximum of 180 days. And so six months. It can be renewed mm -hmm. um, or unless... Uh, you know, the person is serving in the military, then they're good until the end of their deployment plus 31 days. But uh, it's an interesting question that you ask, because how do you get the authority is what we're talking about to act for on behalf of the grant. Right. And, and really that's going to come down to the parent of the grant giving you permission to do that. Or the only other alternative is to ask a probate judge in the County where, you reside to give that authority in the form of a guardianship or conservatorship. Now, if the grand is over the, once they turn 18, the grand can give, they're now legally an adult and able to sign legal documents. That grand can now provide a power of attorney. So we got 
you always have to think what are the sta- what stage of life are we on? How old is the grand, and what authority is needed? And you just hope as they age and become adults that they're still willing to voluntarily allow, uh, you know, their grandparents who have served as parents to continue having authority to help them through life. In in your practice, have you seen? A increase in the number of grand families that you work with, grandparents working with the uh, um, grandkids? I do, maybe in a slightly different sense. So keep in mind, I'm not, I'm not a divorce or family law attorney. Right. So that would be an interesting question to ask someone who's in that lane. <clears throat> I'm in the planning Phase. And I and I do work as an elder law attorney with a, a large percentage of my practice are working with those in the last quarter of life, we'll say. And uh, what I'm seeing more frequently is while they are not raising their grandchildren, they're very concerned about their children being able to take care of their grandchildren, sometimes financially. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, they had a gentleman in this past week who was in his 90s, and he's still trying to coach his children to be productive economically. So they're struggling to hold jobs. You know, they're just, they blow whatever money they get, in his words. And he has grandchildren, and he's thinking, oh my gosh. If I leave my what I've collected, which was significant, to my kids, it'll be gone in a year. You right. know, they're just going to blow it. So I want to make sure my, because I'm not sure they're going to take care of their kids. I want to make sure my grandchildren benefit most uh, because I've done everything I can with For my, my kids. Own children. Yep. I'm still helping them. I mean, he wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry. He was just being very practical as in. You know, I just I just don't know if this is going to get applied appropriately. So I, I'm coming at your question from a slightly different angle. So that's where I see more grandparents expressing concern uh, or, uh, you know, sometimes they have a grand who uh, has a developmental disability. Right. And, you know, parents, again, are under pressure, struggling to, to, to provide for that kid. And the grand also wants to supplement or help. So now we're looking at specialized trusts uh, to help someone who may be receiving uh, financial assistance from the government, so special needs benefits, et cetera. So yes, I am seeing an increase in grandparents uh, trying to support uh, their grandchildren, but more indirectly uh, than actually raising them. But whether you're you know, trying to assist your children who are doing the best they can as as parents, or you're needing to step in as a surrogate parent, it, the the issues are very similar. Uh, you're you're trying to again protect and preserve not only the grand but what is left behind for the grand. Yeah, and and that uh, leads me to ask the question. For the folks in our audience that had not thought about uh, talking to someone with your your specialization, when do they need to talk to you? I mean, if if, if they have these concerns about their grandkids, anytime, correct before the before something happens. Yeah, I would say yes immediately. There is, you know, we all anticipate living a long life. Uh, and I, I, I've done this long enough, and even in my own family, I've experienced sudden traumatic events uh, that just make. You know, COVID was a great example. You know, suddenly people who had been putting off getting legal power in place, and remember, let's go back to what I started with. It's about having the right person with the right power at the right time. That's really what all these documents are about is if something happens, who is authorized to step in? How are things going to be managed, uh, et, et cetera? So we just we have no control over that. We can be the safest driver in the world and some idiot blows a light. And, um, you know, and suddenly 
you know, our family members are having to step up and, and make uh, medical decisions, you know, interact with physicians and care teams, or they, or they may be actually be looking at, oh my gosh, we got to, we got to wrap things up and, and take care of final affairs. So for grandparents, um, you know, the, the very fact that you, now, the very fact that you were in the word grandparent means they're probably someone of, with a few years, you know, and I, I shockingly a year and a half ago, I became a grandparent. I know I'm that. Sure, I'm not quite sure how that happened so quickly. You know, I, I'm not sure I, I qualify. I should qualify, but I do. And so uh, that means, you know, we're we're midlife or later for sure. Uh, and, and so the numbers are not in our favor. So. All of that to say, yes, take action quickly. Meet with someone that, that you can just talk out the questions like we're doing right here. Right. You know, as attorneys, very frequently you can you'll find that they're willing to talk, at least evaluate the situation. And it's not a huge outlay of money, if if any, it depends on the attorney. But if, if uh, chances are, if you are in a grand family, you need to talk to someone like Gene Richards and, and sort it out because every situation is different. You know, I've got a lot of generic questions, but they really don't fit everybody's situation because they need to sit with you and, and, and lay out what's going on in their family right now. And then you would come up with the right plan. Right. Because what's the alternative? Always ask yourself, if I do not plan, what then? And really the only option are the default rules and the default rules are only applied through the court system. So if there's nothing in place to like immediate authority, then the probate court is the court that handles giving someone permission, like the power of attorney, giving someone permission to act. So if, if, if I have a, a, an elderly person has a stroke, they're, just because they're married does not give their spouse authority to act for them. And if they don't have the right person with the right power at the right time, like right now when they need it, now they're going to have to go, <clears throat> the, the, the spouse will have to go to the probate court, prove that you know their spouse is incapacitated in order to get the authority they need. So you should always ask, if I don't have this paper, you know, people say, if I don't have the legal paper in, in place, what happens? The only other option is to go through the probate court process to get that permission. And that's somewhat chaotic. Uh, right. I, and it's not terrible. I, I don't want to badmouth the probate court system. It's there for a reason. But it's a layer of administrative red tape and time. Uh, these days, the like the local probate courts, I you know, I work a lot in Wayne County, Oakland County, Washtenaw, Livingston. You know, these courts are running six to eight weeks. Uh, you know, so you need you need action now, and you're having to wait for them to get you on their docket. So having the legal documents in place before you need them allows someone to step up that you trust and that you've designated specifically to act in your place. And, and again, I, I, I always boil it down, you know, who's the right person, you know, be careful who you, you, you appoint and uh, do they have as much power as they need? Uh, if, if you download a, a power of attorney document from the internet and do it yourself, that's one of my favorites. Frequently I, I run into these and it's like, well, you know, it just doesn't have the tools we need. It's restricted or sometimes they're overly broad. Um, and, and then if you don't have it, you got to go to court. I liken this to my father being a missionary. If you have a second for a quick visual, like a word picture. Sure. Um, so it, it, so we lived in the bush in West Africa. And so dad would go on these circuits to these villages and he'd be gone a couple of days. Well, before he would go on this trip, he would load that car up with two of everything, you know, you had gas cans you got tires you had inner tubes so you got extra inner tubes and patch kits and belts and hoses and chainsaws and i mean the cars they look like you know a hoarder and, and, but why was that because when he got out there into the remote you know forest off of the logging road 
you know, if something went bad, there was no auto zone or other auto parts place to go get help. He had to be self-sufficient. So the planning you're talking about, Craig, encouraging people to engage in is about becoming self-sufficient. It's having that big toolbox of ready to go. When somebody needs it, they just open the toolbox, grab the tool they need and, and do the work that needs to be done. So that's really what this is all about. You're really talking about peace of mind. Right. You're just um, and knowing that everything is set up ahead of time. Hopefully you won't need it. Um, eventually, right. of course, we, we all need uh, the an estate plan or, or uh, um, um, we, there's a final disposition of assets and what have you. But uh, but if you can get this in place ahead of time and it's one less thing to worry about and, and it's 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 not reinventing the wheel or, or uh, you're saying it, it's a, it's a couple conversations with an, with an elder law specialist and, and you can have the, the, the process in place when you need it. Yeah, you're right. These are tools. An attorney like me, an estate planning elder law attorney, we're tool makers. People show up and we say, what do you need? What kind of tools? What's going on in your life? Here you go. Uh, let's give you the tools you need. And, and, you know, we're pretty much out of the picture at that point. Uh, but, Although uh, I will say I will make this point. I'm sorry, I'm hijacking your question. I apologize. <laughs> but uh, you know, I run into this all the time. Is people think, you know, every once in a while you need to open the toolbox uh, because those those hinges get rusty, the tools get rusty, or you know, people don't use those kind of tools anymore. Right. So just a reminder for those in your audience that actually have done. Uh, number one, if you had things in place before you became a grand family, you need to revisit uh, because what you did before may not apply now, right? Uh, or it needs to be revised. Uh, and if you if they're five or years or more, if you've had them five years or more, uh, then I recommend you revisit those with the attorney you drafted them with because that's just my rule of thumb. Things big things happen in my life. <clears throat> excuse me, every five years. Uh, so they're not a set it and leave it. These these are these legal documents need to evolve uh, with life and uh, they do get stale after a while. And the do it yourself programs don't necessarily work in this specialization. Yeah, they. <clears throat> I, I will confess, I will tell people, hey, look, something is better than nothing. But the do-it-yourself, I have had people very disappointed. Uh, just an example was a, a middle-aged couple where uh, the husband had a stroke, and she showed up at my office with um, a power of attorney because they were going to have to try to qualify him for uh, long-term care Medicaid assistance. And unfortunately for her, it didn't have the authority to do what they wanted. This DIY or do-it-yourself document, they just weren't thinking about it. And it was right. very generic. So I don't want to say they're not effective. I mean, there's there's online legal programs. I saw one the other day. They're pretty sophisticated. But again, you're, you're trying to put something together, and you don't even know what the problems are that are going to be faced and so should you include this power should you not have this power should you restrict this power uh, this authority so um you know I, I would rather see someone at least have something uh than not and i will say for for example for those in your audience um there's there's a what we call there's a michigan statutory will uh, we're all over the place i apologize craig you, just yeah. hem me in if you need to but for some people, you know, affordability can be an issue. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> one place to start is uh, there's a Michigan uh, statutory will, but it's part of this uh, pa pamphlet or packet called um, Peace of Mind. And in fact, if they just Google Michigan Peace of Mind, they'll find this PDF document. It's a booklet. But it also includes a medical power of attorney and a fill-in-the-blank will and a place to write, record other personal information about, you know, medical needs and, and wishes, et cetera. Uh, there are also some, um, we'll call them free legal aid uh, programs uh, that will assist the grants. 
and you can, you know, Elder Law of Michigan is one, uh, and there's some others. And I'm always happy to just hand those out when people call. And if they say, well, Mr. Richards, I'm sorry, I, I can't afford you. You know, we don't have any money. Then, well, okay, uh, you know, here's some other resources for you. So don't give up and don't be embarrassed to say, well, I don't know if I can afford this. Right. Because there's usually ways to get the legal tools that you need uh, with, without, you know, again, a, a big outlay of money. Now, is it better to have a custom, you know, is it better to have a tailored suit or at least one that uh, has, has been fit to you than to maybe, you know, just get one off of a, of a rack somewhere? Probably. Uh, but you need it. So, yeah. that, again, I, I encourage people to work with attorneys. I find that the DIY, the do-it-yourself plans very frequently can crumble in a crisis. Okay. And that's what folks need to know. You know, they, you know do they have the right plan in place? And and I'm thinking uh, today of our, our grand families, folks listen to our, our podcast, and maybe they were good planners. And maybe they put together a will and a trust and, and they had everything in place or, or maybe the, um, the grand inherited some assets from a grandma who passed away or a great grandma. But the parent, due to behavioral health or substance abuse issues or any number of things that could derail a parenting, a normal pa- parenting relationship have occurred, is it possible to make changes in a will or a trust to bypass a the the child that's having the behavioral health issues or the substance abuse issues so that the the grandchild is taken care of they are getting the resources that uh, perhaps the great grandma had laid aside but like you were describing for your 90 year old client if he uh, if his kids get get hand, uh, their hands on his money they'll go through it in a heartbeat and that was never his plan. Is there a way around that? There can be. So, um, so we're talking about the grand, and the, the grand that's passed on has left things in a trust for a child, and now it turns out they probably should have rethought that, or maybe circumstances have changed. Correct. Correct. The the child that is getting it has behavioral health issues or they have substance abuse issues or maybe there's a disability. Who knows what's going on? Right. Yeah. That is certainly a challenge. Um, the because they're uh, so tr- in that instance, depends on how the money came to them. Uh, so, again, I need to sometimes we need to set the stage uh, a little bit. So if if the inheritance, I'll call it the inheritance has landed in the hands of the child and it's now theirs you're pretty much out of luck like it's now theirs and they're presumed they're responsible for what they do with it and it's hard to interfere with that unless you said you know mental health issues behavioral issues it could be substance abuse that's where the the parent of that child could say I think they need protecting. And this is where the, the guardianships and the conservatorships can trigger for that person. So the inheritance has come in, it's in their hands and it's just, you know, I, you know, they, I, they're just not able to handle the money. And if there's sufficient basis to say they need, they need to be protected from themselves, then there is a process to do that. But again, you've, You've got to ask a probate court to interfere in that person's life, All right? But once the point is, once it's in their hands, hard to stop. So take, for example, life insurance. If that child's been named as the beneficiary directly on a right. life insurance policy, that's just boom, right? They're getting a check in the mail, take it to the bank, it's their money. How do you intervene at that point? The only way is going to be if that person could be deemed legally incapacitated or uh, needs to be protected due to some uh, deficiency on their right. part. All right. Now, so that's the money's just flowing in. So the point there is watch out for beneficiary designations. Uh, that's another layer of conversation. But, 
you know, how do we set things up? Uh, now, if the money has come to that person in a trust from grandparent, now what are the options? Well, it's going to depend on if it's a just a pass through trust. Uh, you know, sometimes it's just the trust is just the conduit to put it into their hands anyway. <clears throat> However, many trusts, some, I'll, actually, I shouldn't say many, I don't know, you know, there's oodles of them out there. Some trusts will have a holdback mechanism. So sometimes we'll look for that and we'll look for that in the trust to see if it um, allows for there to be a holdback by the trustee. Um, I guess we haven't explained what a trustee is, have we? Um, so if you, so if you think about a, um, I'll use my coffee cup here. Um, a trust is like this container. So it's my coffee cup. And either it's just going to immediately pour out, you know, just it's mine. I do with it what I want. Or it's always going to be managed or held on to by a trustee. The reason trusts work is you have a trustee that has legal authority to manage what's in here. And they're responsible to protect it and to, to distribute it as appropriate. So sometimes in this document, it'll say, hey, if, if the beneficiary has a, a, you know, an episode, you know, let's just say they're, they're in a mental health facility or right. uh, they're in a bad marriage is sometimes an example. Uh, they're yeah. gambling. Right. You trustee, the trust has to pour it out to them, but you have the option to withhold and manage it and hold it and use it for them. So long way to get to your answer to your question. Um, but the trust itself is where you would have to look to see, is there any holdback provision on the trustee? Now, if the child themselves is their own trustee, it's really hard to stop. You've now got to try to tap into the court and explain why they should not be able to misuse the money that's been left. From them. So right. it, all the more reason, Craig, for people to periodically review the plans that they have, because sometimes the signals are there and, you know, try to fix it while you can. Um, so it, don't give up. There can be options. Hopefully the, the plan that's in place or the document, the trust that's in place is sophisticated enough to have some holdback provisions. It's one of those things you're probably not going to find and find in a do-it-yourself document. Right. Let's, well, our guest today on It's a Grand Life has been Gene Richards. He's an estate planning expert and, and an elder law attorney. And Gene, what I have learned from our time together today is that we need to get together again and take one more of the one of these subjects at a time. You bring such a wealth of information uh, to It's a Grand Life, and I can't thank you enough for being our guest today. But I have one uh, final question for you before I let you go today. And what is the one thing, and you may have already said it, but what is the one thing you want to make sure our audience learns from our time together today? If you do not plan, you're stuck with the default rules. And in a grand family situation, most likely the default rules are not your friend. So you need to put together your own plan bypass the default rules. That's absolutely priceless. And how can our listeners get in touch with you if they have some questions? Oh, well, they can reach me uh, at my office, uh, certainly by phone or email. I also have a, uh, we have a website. So I work with, uh, as you mentioned, it's CMDA, Cummings, McClory, Davis, and Acho, and uh, can certainly reach me email, phone, uh, I have an Instagram. I have an Elder Law Facebook page. I got a variety of social media programs. But by the way, if they call, make sure they reference this this program because I'm happy to speak to anyone who's, you know, listening in uh, comes across this resource. Uh, it won't cost them anything to to have a, you know, a phone call with me just to see kind of test the waters and see if they do need to speak with an attorney. It, maybe the initial conversation doesn't cost them anything, but it could save them a small fortune. And 
That's why I'm just so glad you joined us today. I hope you'll come come back again and we take on one of these subjects at a time. And and Gene Richards, thank you so much for being our guest here on It's a Grand Life. Well, it's been an honor for me. Thank you, Craig. I, I apologize. I tend to talk too much. <laughs> it was absolutely great. Remember to never waste your pain. Your story can help others. That's the whole point of It's a Grand Life. Please reach out to me. I can be a blessing to you and pray for you or help you connect to free resources that can make your journey a little easier. God can use your situation to bless others, even halfway around the world. Together, we have hope. And as my own grandma used to say, and she was always quoting biblical promises to me, but this one from Isaiah 26.3, he will keep him or her in perfect peace, whose mind is fixed on him because he trusts in him. Please make sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. I look forward to talking to you again real soon. But remember, with God's help, it's a grand life. Mm-hmm.